everybody who had that night. Uh, the foundation um, has also met since then to, um, to name, to decide uh, the teachers and organizations that are beneficiaries of our spring grants. And um, it's one of the great pleasures of being on the board of the foundation to read all those applications that our teachers and our schools and our parents submit because their creativity and the ways they want to enrich the experience for all of our kids is really an inspiration for all of us. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to read those applications and I wish we always had enough money to fund all of them completely. Um, so we need to keep supporting the foundation so we can keep helping all of our staff members do these great things for our students because they, I want to specifically ask that Thank uh, Kathy Battalamenti for all of her hard work. Um, it's, it really has been a tremendous benefit to our school district. Um, just to give you a, a tiny snapshot, some of the variety of things that uh, the foundation is going to be supporting. It goes from everything from forensics programs and robotics programs, uh, but also school-wide programs and wellness. Um, assembly for music enrichment, uh, for Chinese and French programs, butterflies, just amazing mathematics. <laughs> mathematics. It's really a, uh, fixing some of our ORF musical instruments so they're better. Uh, it's a wonderful variety of things that we're able to help to support. And thank you to all of our school found, uh, community to help to make those things be, be uh, come into reality for our kids. Um, some of the other things that are coming up are um, on May 5th because of the lovely weather that has not been happening. Um, the spring fling at the farm was postponed for an, a better day. And so now it's going to be on May 5th. It's a pancake breakfast. You do need to buy tickets online in advance because they have time slots that go anywhere from 9 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But it's a pancake breakfast, so they want to be sure that they can serve everybody and not have to make them wait too long. So please go on to our website and buy your tickets. It'll be fun. The barns will be open. There's lots of wonderful new animals at the farm and it'll be a great time. Um, but also a special part of this time of the year, it's already time for kindergarten roundup for next year. Yeah, so first one of our elementary schools has it on April 30th, and then it's within the next couple of weeks thereafter. So please go to our website for the dates and times for each of, each of our elementary schools, or it's a little bit different. But uh, it's an exciting time to get ready for the year ahead already. And then also summer camp registration through our recreation department is also available. Um, this coming Monday uh, is the next DARE meeting at 6.30 right here in this room. Also on Monday, right here in this room, um, uh, Representative Mike McCready will be um, meeting with, with families, or with uh, citizens at 12.30. And also on Monday, <laughs> same time, at one o'clock up over at our high school, um, will be the Traub Assembly, uh, where we have the opportunity to, to hear about this year's winners in art and music. But there is also the uh, uh, art exhibit that is available at the uh, High School Media Center. It opens this Friday and will be on from Friday until next Wednesday. And uh, it's always fascinating to see what are the work that our students are doing. So I encourage you, if you have the chance, to stop by to the high school to come and see the art exhibit. It's wonderful. And I uh, hope all my colleagues will be able to come to the assembly at 1 o'clock on Monday. Actually, day after tomorrow at the Nature Center, um, our Johnson, the E.L. Johnson Nature Center, Center is planting 42 trees and they're looking for some volunteers. Um, they are getting trees from Relief, Michigan, Michigan DNR with support of the township and they're looking for volunteers to help plant. So starting at 845 in the morning, it asked, Dan Badgley is asking you to email him at dbadgley at bloomfield.org or call him. So it says he's trying to get some RSVPs to have an idea how many volunteers he's going to have. What was the date on that again? It's day after tomorrow, this Saturday morning. Saturday. Yep. Um, another exciting one's a little bit farther out in the future. Um, last year, our superintendent had the great opportunity to play with the Bloomfield Hills Jazz Band down at Cliff Bells. I don't think he's going to make it this time because I think we have a conflict. I think it's actually a dare night. It's a dare night. But I did go down with my husband to Cliff Bells last year and it was so much fun. Um, it is on Monday, May 14th at 7 p.m. 
and uh, it's like ten dollars for a ticket of great jazz and fun at Cliff Bells. I really encourage you to go online and have and, and be part of that. It's it's a great fun time, and it's great to hear the talent of a of our students. It's just amazing. And I think that's all I've got. So we have a lot of things. Please mark your calendar for all the good things coming down the pike, and uh, there's lots more coming. Not too far in the future. Oh, what, one other big one coming up next week is uh, um, Bloomfield Youth Guidance, uh, which is next Tuesday um, at the high school. We'll be honoring 23 students, so um, that's really a, a really special opportunity to honor um, students who do extraordinary things mm -hmm. in our district. And it's not just about their grades; it's about some of the um, humanitarian and um, other extraordinary gifts that our kids share. So with that, I invite my superintendent to give his report. I got nothing. You covered it all. <laughs> that was great. That was really good. You got a lot. There's so many things that I missed and wouldn't have even um, had thought to bring up. So that was great because there's just a lot going on. There's a and, lot going on. And it's all great stuff. I, uh, I wanted to just mention a couple things. The equity and inclusion work that we've been embarked on for <laughs> over four years now is really continuing in earnest. We've had a lot of... Um, um, training this very week. Um, we had an Institute for Healing Racism. Uh, we've had a Master Champions class. And Dr. El Sayed, I don't know if you, as a participant, would you like to just speak yeah. to that for a moment? Sure. Um, you know, this is something that we've been working on at, uh, for several years now. And we've worked through several different levels to get to the Master Champions, where we had this whole room filled with people and uh, we were talking, um, this was actually our fourth day. It's um, every month we've been having one whole day that we've all come together and had training and be working together to really coordinate as a district to, um, to really operationalize now this across the district and provide the processes. And so it was so exciting. Um, and everyone has such great ideas and already things are happening. The, the experiences that people were, uh, and the initiatives that they've been taking in their classrooms are just fantastic. And so we had a graduation ceremony and so this was our first cohort. And so um, it, this is just such a wonderful time that, um, that this very important work that we've been working on as a community is really coming to fruition and, and really as at, is at a tipping point where we can um, bring everyone forward, so that's really good. Well, thanks for sharing, shedding a little more light and also for participating and being one of those master right. champions as is Mr. Colin, so we're really thankful. Um, a couple other things, I'm just really proud of our forensics teams. They just continue knocking it out of the park. BHMS is going to states on Saturday. Yeah. And um, the Bionic Blackhawks, same with them. Our robotics team uh, won uh, the, safe, the safety award and for the third year in a row won the prestigious chairman's award uh, as they're on their way to the world championships. Uh, ranked 18th out of over 400 teams uh, this year. And uh, they're going to compete at Cobo Hall and Ford Field. Um, and if any, anyone has an opportunity to go down there, uh, that is going to be an event um, to be remembered. And if you have an opportunity to go, to go down and see that event, it's uh, April 25th, 26th, 27th. Uh, it's in that neighborhood, that uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, just phenomenal. And if you're going, you have to get a badge in advance, so talk to me. I just did it. And, you know, I just want to thank our, our, our teams across the district. You know, um, in life, things don't always go perfectly smoothly. We've had some weird weather. We've had some power outages. Uh, we've had some, some people with, you know, unexpected um, uh, family situations where, you know, we've had to, uh, they haven't been able to be uh, in a classroom or in a school. And everybody's just pulling together. I, you know, whether it's our, our uh, physical plant services team or whether it's our administrators or our teachers, everybody's covering for one another. Everybody's making sure that the job gets done. And um, we've had a week like that. And uh, I'm just marveling. and I'm so grateful for the, the people that, who just stepped up to make things run smoothly even when um, circumstances arise. And uh, um, <coughs> lastly, one, two, two things I want to mention. Safety and security work continues. Uh, if you look on our web page, on our website, you'll see a lot of, uh, a lot of information around safety and security. Uh, we had a, a, uh, a panel 
discussion, uh, including our chief of police uh, um, from Bloomfield Township, who came in and, and was part of that panel, including one of our students who was on that panel. And uh, that is available on our website. That was televised. And so we had a really good, robust discussion about where the state of uh, safety and security is in the district, with you know, post Parkland particularly. And uh, we are continuing to gather information. There will be a survey going out, our, our regular community survey will contain some questions um, around uh, us trying to get further understanding and information uh, from parents about some of their preferences for next moves that we might take in terms of improving our security. Even though it's at a very high level, you can always get better. So um, we look for that survey and, and make sure that you avail yourselves of those items. We're going to take the top prioritized items and start putting them into place right away. We thank our community for all of, its, uh, all of their input. And lastly, and I'm saving the most exciting news for last, our very own uh, school board president, Cynthia Von Oyen, um, was named the Michigan Association of School Boards 2017 uh, President Award of Recognition was bestowed upon her. It is their highest honor, and uh, there were only 10 awards out of over 4,000 school board members in the state of Michigan only 10 received that award this year. In addition, um, she has had some other awards of just, uh, um, she just collects these things apparently. Uh, she's also received the Master Platinum Award from MASB. She's the Lifetime Volunteer Leadership Award recipient um, for in 20, 2015 from the Greater West Bloomfield Michigan Week Celebration Group. Um, she does a stellar j job and it's about it, it's a, I should say it's about time, but it's a wonderful thing when um, others see what we see, Cynthia. Thank you for all the service you've given at such a high level to our school district and our community over the years. We really appreciate you. And thank you to all of you who've sent me notes. It's been an amazing experience. I've had the true experience of the internet over this. I've gotten responses from neighbors from 30 years ago and <laughs> nieces and nephews around the country who I never would have mentioned it to. So it's been really amazing. It's been really fun. Thank you very much. I appreciate all the sweet, lovely notes I have gotten from employees and my colleagues. I appreciate it very much. <sighs> okay. On that note, I think I the secretary for the consent motion, please. I move that the Board of Education approve the recommendations detailed in the consent agenda as follows. Request to approve minutes, study session of March 15, 2018. Request to approve minutes, regular meeting of March 15, 2018. Millage rate development for fiscal year 2018-19. Request to approve monthly financial reports. Request to approve disbursement reports. Request to approve refuge collection one year extension. Request to approve passenger van purchases in the amount of $64,626. Request to approve HR actions. Do I have support? Support. Support from Mr. Palantir on discussion. Ms. Barron. Yeah. Um, looking at the uh, list of names of people who are retiring, one of them uh, is very close to me, uh, a woman uh, that I've known for about 35 years now, uh, Ms. Greenlee, Tina Greenlee, who I knew as Tina Collegius back in the day. Uh, Tina is our um, uh, theater uh, director at the high school, and we have such a very strong both visual and performing arts programs all the way through our elementary, middle, and, and high school. But Tina really is part of a very strong team at the high school. She puts on a, a musical uh, in the fall and a, uh, a stage show in the spring, which will come up in a few weeks, matter of fact. I, what show is it? Does anyone know? I'm not even sure. But it's open, I think, in a couple of weeks. So anyway, so Tina is we'll uh, going to be retiring. Pardon me? We'll have the answer by the next week. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Tina is retiring, and we just want to wish her well in her uh, in retirement and joy. Very good. Anybody else? I just also want to call up a couple other people. Tommy Gersh is uh, also retiring, and she's done such amazing work at Wing Lake with our students, and um, she will be sorely missed. She's done, she's like an angel to those children. So um, thank her so much. 
and also Lynn George, who's been at um, Model High School for quite a long time, and uh, she is like a mom for those kids. <laughs> uh, she really does amazing things. So not that everybody else here isn't wonderful, but Lynn, Lynn's been with us for 33 years, Tommy's been with us for 21 years, and Tina's been with us for 40 years. They, that's an amazing legacy that they have given to us and an amazing number of children's lives who they have touched and changed and for the better. So thank you to all of them so much and everybody else who's on this list who just doesn't happen to have that many years. <laughs> but anyway, any other discussion? All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. All right, so then we, our next uh, item is a special report on our literacy celebration. And uh, I think Todd's gonna introduce our in elementary principals. Good evening, uh, this year we have been on a pretty significant exploration to study our literacy um, programming in an effort to really precision our practice and uh, uh, to really increase the uh, cohesiveness of that particular discipline and uh, so tonight is part of that process we have um, our elementary schools represented here to talk about some of the celebrations at an upcoming BIC we'll be discussing some of the efforts uh, led by the literacy learning team to dig more into uh, some of the um, some of the insights that we have fallen into regarding the study that we've been doing this year uh, but tonight is really to kind of bring forward to some of the rich work that's been happening within uh, our elementary schools. And before I introduce um, those that are here to present, I wanted to just take a moment and recognize somebody who couldn't be with us here tonight. And, um, you know, as you know, Carrie Croker's husband uh, recently passed away, and today was uh, her husband's Craig funeral. And um, I just wanted to make sure that I uh, mentioned Carrie this evening because she has been a pivotal role in all of our efforts regarding. Um, uh, literacy at our elementary level and she is an important part of this group and I know she would um, you know she would have wanted to be here to present and if anything we probably had to tell her to to stay away and um, um, but I certainly wanted to to mention her this evening her staff has been outstanding in her absence and has helped put some of this work together so that Eastover is represented as well and uh, I couldn't be more proud of the staff and community over at Eastover, how they have pulled together. Um, even today, we had uh, Mary Blair and Harleen Singh over there uh, leading, the, leading the school through a difficult day, uh, helping coordinate all of our guest teachers, all of our parent volunteers that really just chipped in to help make sure that today ran smoothly. And I couldn't be more proud of them, uh, of, of the hard work that Carrie's been doing her her contributions to this work even though she's not here to be part of the team and I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of everyone behind me that um, you know we really appreciate her efforts even though she can't be here to to be part of the presentation and the board sends yeah. so but I will get into introducing uh, those are here we have Kimberly Hampton Jenna Kennedy Nick Russo uh, Dr. Mary Hillberry and Adam Shear here to present some of our elementary literacy celebrations and I think if if they're ready, they'll come on up and, and begin. Good evening. Good evening. Technology gods are working. Yeah, so let's get in the right spot. Uh, so Cynthia, I agree with you. It's, it's timely that now that we're finished celebrating our fourth winter, we can move forward with the celebrations of spring just in time. Um, for literacy special, uh, celebrations this evening. So um, as we work through what's been happening at our four elementary buildings, um, we're gonna tuck that under uh, an umbrella of the essential practices as we move through uh, our sharing with you here this evening. And those essential practices uh, are really a standard of care, uh, minimum standard of care for every child every day in every classroom. And it's a statewide partnership really uh, intended to lift uh, 
uh, collective capacity across the state and our uh, principals, our teachers, our elementary learning community has really leaned in to uh, self-study of their practice as well as uh, embracing professional learning as, as we've moved to um, think about these essentials and alongside our current practice. This is one of our resource resources that we're, we're working with. So we're going to start off uh, with Essential One. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Cynthia, congratulations. Thank you, So Adam. cool. Um, so last summer, we attended some training around essential practices around literacy. And uh, essential number one was deliberate research informed efforts to foster literacy, motivation, and engagement within and across uh, our lessons. And that's for everybody. And so how, what does that look like in a classroom? Well, it's providing daily opportunities for children to make choices in their reading and writing. I guess with the word choices, it's we should add within limits uh, to that. So what, to, what we read within limits, what to listen to. And when we say listen to, um, part of reading is listening. And um, a lot of people don't think of it that way, but that's exactly what it looks like. What to write, so there's choice involved with that how to respond, and we do that in many different ways in our elementary classrooms, the order in which to complete tasks, again, when that makes sense to do that, and um, around homework or home learning options as well. The teacher creates opportunities for children to see themselves as successful readers and writers. Um, the tasks for which success is well-defined include Things like learning targets, we should see those up in our classrooms. What's the point of our learning today? Um, we have things like anchor charts, which essentially cement the processes that we want them engaged in. Rubrics might be one of those things that we're looking for in a classroom. Uh, checklists could be another thing. Teacher provides regular opportunities for children to collaborate with peers in reading and writing, such as through small group discussions of texts, of interests and opportunities to write. Um, so here you will see Think Pair Share Time, uh, which goes on in all of our schools. There might be choral readings, uh, like you see in that middle picture. There might be group writing, where we're adding on to one another's thinking, and we can look at that writing when it's all done um, and get kind of this big gestalt of what's happening in our classrooms. And finally, generating uh, reading interest. Um, that's me with the book, could say Adam, but it says David gets in trouble. Um, I make weekly um, suggestions over the PA. It seems like kids really love it when the principal comes on and makes suggestions of what to read. They race down to the media center um, and try and pick those books up. So that's been a lot of fun. And that's been a nice change at the building. And now I think, Jenna, I think you're up. Hello. I've never been in front of the board. My name is Jenna Kennedy. I am a part-time reading recovery teacher and part-time math interventionist at Conant. So uh, thank you. So it's great to be here in front of you guys today. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the things that we're doing at Conant. The second essential practice um, revolves around literacy in comprehension specifically. So teachers being able to build knowledge in strategic activity and reading throughout the years. So the first thing that they do to build that comprehension, that knowledge and strategic activity is through facilitating discussions to support the student's interpretation of the text. So one of the ways that we do that in every single classroom every day is whole group read alouds, kindergarten through fourth grade. So the students are able to have an exposure to a variety of text, if it's nonfiction, fiction, realistic fiction, historical fiction, but it's always above their reading level. So they're being pushed to utilize these comprehension strategies at a higher text level than something that they could be independently reading themselves. So the teachers are able to ask these open-ended questions and expand the student's vocabulary that's in context directly. And since they're, as you can see from the picture, sitting next to their peers, they're able to have these peer-to-peer -peer discussions which give them the opportunity to argue with the text, to agree with the text, to con infer, to confer with each other. And it allows for really deep opportunities for connections and for them to hear their fellow peers' connections to the text as well. Another way that they build comprehension is through explicit comprehension strategies in small groups. And so all teachers, kindergarten through fourth grade, have these targeted small group instruction 
where they're able to directly focus on the children's abilities and interest levels and they can scaffold the instruction to really meet the needs of where they're at in, in order to lift them to where they need to go next. So they're helping them find the main ideas, make connections again, draw inferences, and they're really able to support the student's interpretation of the text during the small group instruction. And the last thing is that the wonderful thing of being out of the classroom is I get to see this strategic activity being built from kindergarten all the way up to fourth grade. And they're working on comprehension strategies at every single grade, but it's really building upon each other throughout the year. So up on the screen, you've got kindergarten on the left or all the way through fourth grade on the right. And as you can see kind of how they move through the grades, how their comprehension gets a lot more in depth. And by the end, they're really taking a historical fiction, a realistic fiction, and comparing and contrasting the differences. So that is what we are doing at Conan. Thank you. All right. So next we're talking about uh, writing, research and standard aligned writing, which really uh, with very young students is about building that identity, building that um, sense of self as a writer and building stamina, um, their success along the way as they take piece by piece uh, the, the instruction, the explicit instruction, as well as the process that they're living into, how um, they revise their thinking, draft their thinking, and also uh, doing that work with choice as paramount to what they're writing about. And um, Essential Six talks to us about that. We're studying models of other writers, whether that might be through a picture book, through a nonfiction text. We're also thinking about writing across the disciplines uh, in ways that might impact science, for example. Our students were doing some science journaling. They were doing some research and labeling, uh, much like a scientist might talk about uh, the very specific discipline vocabulary that comes from sharing their research. This was a part of the uh, exposition. Uh, exhibition, pardon me, um, around both deforestation uh, as well as some lower grade work there that I cannot give you context for. Um, but we know that our writers are thinking about the writing across each discipline as compared to writing only for the sake of writing. We know we're growing those skills as well, but I would, I would highlight that that's really transdisciplinary. Uh, you might see students in a, on a carpet in a classroom. This left picture is in kindergarten where a phrase is created either by the teacher or by the students themselves. And we use those kind of interactive writing experiences to really grow fluency. Uh, you might hear some choral reading there. It's also a really great place to embed uh, in an authentic way with a morning message some um, high frequency words that students are getting repeated exposure to. This is a great illustration on the left there. You see a um, progression of writing. It goes from level one to eight, and the picture doesn't show you all. Um, but this uh, work is really a beautiful intersection between instruction and assessment. And our kindergarten uh, staff at Eastover has really taken on uh, that idea of teacher as action researcher. They're thinking about their writing instruction, and they're really challenging students to take what they've written and hold it up to a model and do some self-assessment work. What have I written and how does that compare to what my target is, as Adam was referencing in terms of learning targets. On the side, you see a second grade teacher who's thought about powerful conclusions and what those conclusions should include uh, when you're in second grade. Um, and you can see up on the top, I love bulldogs all the way down to a more sophisticated conclusion um, that has much more detail there. And so as a part of that learning, the teacher then on the left you see is having a conference with the, that group. They had done some um, peer um, revision with one another on this day in the classroom and talk to one another about their conclusions, give one another ideas about what they might hope to hear differently or ideas they would have or yeah, that's great. Uh, and, and teacher interacts with that uh, both in the conferring time as well as in that time you see on the carpet as a targeted share. And that's really intended to lift the level of metacognition. Students are naming what they're doing as writers so that that transfer really pulls forward to the next task or, or the next um, time that they're moving through that writing process. So these kindergarten students here are lining up their pieces uh, with the targets they have. They've, they've added clips as they've drafted along the way and made goals for themselves about what they've currently done and what they'd like to do better. And I couldn't uh, resist the opportunity to tell you about this young man here. So. Well, because because I have upper 
letters in lower than lowercase letters. Okay, and what else? And that's why that's why I I, I have upper letters and lower letters. Okay, are you snapping out your words? Mm-hmm. What about your sight words? Can you show me where you're spelling them correctly? What sight words are spelled correctly? Then I'm an Okay, so did you spell two correctly? Mm-hmm. Okay. Did you spell go correctly? Yep. Okay. Go. Oh, that's go. Cool. What about? What's, yep. What's that? You. Can. The. Oh, oh. And do you have spaces between your words? Mm -hmm. And do you have uh, punctuation? Periods, question marks? Mm -mm. Okay, so what's something you need to work on? Periods. And adding punctuation? Can okay. I right now do periods? Sure, you could do that. All right wonderful young kindergarten man. I would point out that was uh, probably about January and you see the level of fluency that he's got going on those pages there as a, as a kindergarten writer. So this work has a, a great deal of power for our, our young boys and girls. Mr. Pollitier was just commenting, he looks like a future banker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is serious business. I'm very proud of my yeah. learning here. Can't you yeah. see that? He knew Duh. he was going to be taped that day. Yeah. I think. <laughs> That's impressive. So I selected um, essential eight because a lot of the practices have to do with the skills involved in literacy but essential eight is about the passion of being a literate individual and living a literate life and how do we build that in our students and um, you know I, I think about it as a principal and I think about it as a parent that you know one of my goals is absolutely to have kids just fall in love with reading by the time they leave our schools and because it's just such a rich aspect of my life and it's something I value so highly and it's something I want for all the kids in our building. And so this essential is important to me and um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we help kids along that path um, at the elementary level. So specifically one of the descriptors is that the classroom includes a wide range of books and we know from our own experience as parents and educators that um, children grow into the educational life around them or the intellectual life around them and being surrounded by books at home and at school is a big part of the first step. So having a wealth of books and resources for them to choose from. Um, including digital books uh, with our iPad technology that we have. Kids have access in the classroom to a wide range of additional books that they don't have physically in the classroom. And most of those resources are available to them at home as well. So this is kind of a little collage here showing some of the um, examples of things that we also use to help generate interest in reading. So. Um, having just displays in the classroom and in the media center where kids can see books and get interested in books and maybe they're going to grab one off the shelf because it's got a cover that looks intriguing to them or it has the picture of a dog on it and they really love dogs so they want to pull that book. Um, you have books that are appropriate reading levels for the children in your classroom so they don't get frustrated when they lay hands on a book, that they have success when they're reading it and that leads them to want to choose another one. Students have individual book bins in the classroom. You can see them on the right side, the blue bins, and they have a variety of different texts in there. So when it's time to apply some of the skills that they've learned, they have books that are interesting to them to look at and refer to to practice some of those skills. Um, and then down on the bottom, you'll see our Media Center pages where there are all of those apps available for kids to access, um, including resources that they can utilize over the summer so they have continuing um, sources for literature in their lives. So books and materials that are also connected to children's interests and also their background knowledge and their cultural experiences. So one of the things that um, we have worked toward over the years is building a library collection um, in other languages for our students. And so this this shelf is an example. It's, it's I mean it's very tiny down there but um, we have books in Japanese, we have books in Chinese, we have books in Arabic, we have books in every language that we can get our hands on. And that's been a very deliberate effort to acquire texts from our international families as they leave the district. Are they willing to donate um, books and materials to our library? So that when our kids come in, 
they feel at home because they see that we have materials there that are, hey, I see myself in that book, or I see my language, or that's you know the, the language I see my parents reading at home. Um, and that can be very powerful. We also, um, as part of our district and school improvement efforts through our um, experiences with the global ed teams and their training through Global Champions and uh, the Institute for Healing Racism, have made a concerted effort to really look at our existing classroom libraries and curate them so that they more accurately represent our student populations. Um, and we are discarding books that really um, are not appropriate any longer or that aren't re representative of um, the children that we see in our classrooms or the experiences that we see in our classrooms. So by way of example, if you have you know, a book in your collection back from the 70s that all the you know, firefighters are men, you might want to toss that one and replace it with one that's a little more gender inclusive by way of example. So that's something that we have all been working on and that's a continuing ongoing effort. Um, allowing kids to take books home, you'll see on the left the book in the bag and those of you who have had children in elementary school in recent years, that should be a very familiar piece to you. So it's sending home a book with a child with a very deliberate intention. A lot of our teachers will attach a post-it so the parent knows exactly what to work on with the child when that book comes home. We also have obviously the classroom lending libraries, the uh, media center. Uh, lends out books on a regular basis, and then of course amazing partnerships with the public libraries. Um, the apps, again, we, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, we at Lone Pine are extremely uh, grateful to the West Bloomfield Public Library because they have an amazing program where they partner with us every year and donate a ton of books to our school. Um, and that's another way that we connect to get books in the lives of um, our children and really build enthusiasm for reading. Of course, we had to get Corey in here because, again, building that enthusiasm and that view of life is, you know, a, a rich experience of reading. So we have Corey coming in to be a guest reader. Um, particularly this last month, we've had a ton of parents coming in to be mystery readers. So there's a lot of excitement built up around, you know, who's going to be the reader of the day, and the kids get clues and they get all excited, and um, so it, it becomes something that's very fun. Um, that picture on the bottom right, that's, that's um, I, right out the back door of my office. The kids line up out there in the morning, so literally I stepped out in the hall to kind of supervise the kids, and this is what I walk up on, is a group of third grade boys. Instead of socializing, instead of like, you know, wrestling, doing, you know, their boy thing in the morning, they're all parked on the floor, and they've all pulled out a book, and they're all reading. I mean, that's the kind of thing that makes your heart sing as a building administrator, like these kids love to read and that's what I love to see. Um, bullet five is about the opportunities for children to engage in independent reading materials of their choice every day, but it's deliberate. So it's not just randomly picking things, it's actually very purposeful intent with the teacher working with the student on a specific skill, but maybe with the book that's their choice. And then finally, we get to questions. I couldn't resist these two little pieces of writing here. On the left, we have Trevor who says, if I was reading an informational book, then my brain will explode. <laughs> and then Gloria on the right says, reading makes me feel happy because I do it with my dad. And then, of course, I had to sneak my favorite child right there in the minute, who is a passionate lover of books and reading. Um, and he's reading The Wild Robot Escapes. So. Any questions? I would just say invite school board members to come and be mystery Absolutely. guest readers too. young man who was like pointing to the to the easel and stuff like that so he was making a presentation or he was pointing to things that were going to be recited or was that in mine or was that a previous one? No, that was a previous one, I'm oh, pretty sure. Back. Oh, that was in yours. And so um, what you might see uh, early in the day is a morning message. Sometimes students co-construct that. Sometimes the teacher might put something there. You can see uh, today is Tuesday. It might be November. Um, and we have Spanish computer lab and music today. Love, Mrs. Colby. And so what this young man is doing is leading the room, reading that statement. And a variety of things might happen there. It might be the way that we'd first explore how we respond to an exclamation point. So we're not going to just read a sentence or two, but we're probably going to read it with a lot of, oh, wow, his kind first, of thing. His first presentation. 
Right, I mean, exactly. Yeah, and it's it's a really big deal in the classroom to have this pointer and have this role. Mm. So that sense of community that comes in times like these, um, as he leads and, and kind of commands his group and they interact with him, um, has, has a lot of cachet to it as well. <laughs> and I also noticed like little breakout groups of like three kids in each group. Is, is, is that working? Basically what you're trying to do, if, if I understand it correctly, is just set up a rudimentary understanding of, of teamwork and, you know, group, group work and, and all that other things. kind of stuff. Is, is that, how's that working out? How's that working out? So our students would come together um, for a variety of reasons across mm -hmm. the day. And they, they would, just as you've said, share idea with one another, either uh -huh. in partnerships or in triads or, or in larger groups as well, usually with some kind of shared focus, something they've completed perhaps independently or collectively. And it really would um, be a part of the instructional design on the part of the teacher. But in terms of reading and writing instruction, they are kind of flexing from that whole group instruction point mm -hmm. to let me go try that on by myself, practice with independence what I've just learned, and then I'm usually going to come up alongside someone. I mean, they're going to share my learning with them, uh, or I might shift into a different kind of reading or writing practice exercise, uh, like the group at the table who were uh, collaborating over their conclusions. So those four young men at the table each had composed an individual conclusion. They were sharing it with one another, and their buddies were saying, "Hey, that I, I like what you did there," or "Ooh, I'm you." I think you can do better. Go take a look at those four quadrants and, and assess yourself. So it might be for a variety of reasons based on the lesson. I'm not sure if I'm really answering your question. Well, no. Well. I, I guess um, uh, what what I what what hit me is that you know these are things that you know we would expect the kids to do in in middle school or or high school or something like that. And now we're we're down at the elementary level, which is great because you know you there's there's this belief. Um, in the um, in the world of psychology, that basically you know we are living out our lives as adults through the subconscious lens of our child, and we're viewing the world based on experiences that we had when we were very young, and we're reacting to things based on things that we experienced when we were very young. So the fact that that we're setting up an environment for them, uh, for them to have positive experiences doing these things, whether it's making a presentation or being part of a group or breakout group or whatever, is really, in, in my mind, just really setting them up for success. I mean, because this is something that will be definitely be able to carry all the way through school and out into whatever their profession might be. So I'm so, I'm so glad that, you know, you're seeing positive outcomes by bringing it down to the elementary level. I mean, that's a dream, and it's... It's, an, it's a reality. I mean, I think it's just awesome. It's very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Any Anything else on the board? Thank, Thank you. you very much. It's, it's exciting. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Get you back to your... Is there someone following us that I can queue up here? So uh, next up is going to be Tina and Brian who are going to be giving a sinking fund update for us because we do have a um, sinking fund millage election coming up next month. Um, so what we did is uh, we are we actually lifted information directly from our website um, so the slides you'll see have a lot of words on them we're not going to read to you uh, but these were the highlights that we wanted to present tonight especially for anyone watching from home and then at the end we will actually go to the website the website is live and we have been adding information especially as questions arise that perhaps we haven't thought of so to start, um, what are we asking our community for? Um, first, our district has had a sinking fund millage since 2004 uh, through the generosity of our community. We are asking for a replacement millage, which I'll explain in a later slide, for the same rate we levied last year, 7.7165, for six years. And that's going to generate, uh, based on today's taxable values, about $2.5 million each year. What is a sinking fund? That's been a common question as well, especially that unique name. And by <laughs> definition, and I always you know, look at the finance guys on the board. Um, so when we think about a sinking fund or actually look it up by definition, it is a method for us to actually set aside revenue 
uh, in this case on an annual basis, to uh, replace wasting assets or for capital needs. And so that's basically what we've been doing since 2004. Um, our goal is not to uh, save it. Um, it is to use it for needs that Brian will explain in a moment. So what can sinking fund dollars be used for, Brian? So the three R's, repair, renovation, and remodeling, um, along with construction. It cannot be used for maintenance items. It cannot be used for salaries, wages, uh, that type of thing. That's Michigan law. Correct. Um, examples of the past, uh, you guys all know this so well, but a lot of what we do you can't see or you don't realize, uh, like roofing and, and boilers and things like that. Some of the stuff you can see but may not recognize, like windows and doors and energy efficient upgrades. Um, and then there are some things that are much more visible. Um, Mark, you'll remember the West Hills Drive when there was only one way in and one way out. At Ford, you'll remember the, uh, the leaking cloud canopy system <laughs> over at East Hills Middle School and oh, yeah. the uh, ADA elevator where people used to have to go take their wheelchair down Kensington Road to get from one side of the building to the other. Now they can stay indoors, so that's kind of nice. Um, and then there's some, you know, some of the things have some visual pop. This is an East Hills uh, Middle School bathroom before and after pictures. That, that's a lot better. <laughs> And that was actually just one of the pictures. So when we go to the website, you'll see there are many more, and we won't have time to actually go through all of those tonight. But it's just, it was amazing to me uh, in pictures how much was captured with before and after or during the process of the going through the project and, and what it looks like uh, over all of these years. So why replace the current sinking fund? Um, essentially, Brian mentioned what we can use sinking fund dollars for now, which is law. And recently, legislation was passed to expand those uses to include security and technology, safety, security, and technology. So even though our current millage doesn't expire till December, and we have one more year we could levy under the current law, we would like to take advantage of these expanded uses. But to do so, we need to ask our voters to approve a replacement. And that's why the word replacement is used in the ballot language. What are some examples of things that we may seek to do? So camera systems, we've realized the benefit of a high quality camera system at the high school. Um, it, it deters a lot of problems and it solves problems very, very quickly. Um, and the camera systems today are, uh, we can have live feeds go to the police station. Um, we can monitor things from remote, you know, through, through web access now. Um, so that's something you might, you know, we would consider for the rest of our buildings. Um, camera systems for our buses along with GPS tracking and um, there's apps that parents could use to track their students, their child's bus, uh, the location of it, when the bus is going to get there in the morning so they don't have to stand outside for so long. Now, for more information, especially those watching from home, uh, the website and the webpage related to the sinking fund is populated with so much more than we just covered. And the easiest way is to go to bloomfield.org and in the search box in the upper right hand corner, type in sinking fund. And when you do so, the screen usually does not go black. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is the part, I never really thought there would be an issue with this. <laughs> okay, no, well, I mean, okay. I think you might have put sinking ton good Well, yeah, it still shouldn't be a uh, sinking ton. Well, that we is believe that you, though. David, can you hear us over? Oh. Coming back. We have a problem. We're coming uh, back. Yeah. I don't give up that easily. Your connection is interrupted. Okay. I am actually going to go to, and we should have us right here. And one more time. Yay. All right. First yes. option. Okay, persistence can be good. Um, so many of the things that we covered truly were lifted right from this page. And if I just scroll down, you can see how lengthy the page is with information, comparing us in the county to other districts. Our capital related um, millage rate, just to note, is the lowest in the county, uh, actually by quite a lot. And when we look at projects, past projects here, uh, this is what we showed you, but there are many more examples. 
And then the one thing I really wanted everyone to pay attention to is on the right side, future sinking fund work, which also includes things that are being done now or soon, and then some of the later items listed by location, every single location within our district, um, things that we have derived from our meetings that we call just the facts, going building to building with a group of us and listening to the needs that are there along with the assessment that Brian does with his team. So for instance, if I look at um, Way Elementary, project description, uh, it's color coded. So now and done would be anything in red, soon, uh, we project to be able to do that with our sinking fund monies. Uh, if the replacement passes, we have one more year under the current. And then uh, the black items are actually later, but not within the budget of the proposed sinking fund. So the, the answer to sometimes the question we hear is, is that enough? Basically, the sinking fund is allowing us to keep our buildings up. Um, it's allowing us to take care of things with, that are emergency or not, um, but yet it's not enough for everything that we may envision for our students in their, in their learning environments. But these by building should give everyone that's interested in these locations a picture of what that is. Mm -hmm. And then the last item I would leave you with, which is a question we will be adding to the website, is um, somebody uh, asked, what about the sale of real estate and the proceeds and what happened with those monies? So um, the two key would be the Wabik land, which did close, and we received the proceeds. We placed them in the capital improvement fund. We do not use those for operations. Uh, we've discussed, and the, bo the board also directed those monies to go into the capital improvement fund to take care of needs like the sinking fund, or the sinking fund does have parameters of that we have to live within, and so maybe there are projects that are outside of that scope. But those monies, um, we know the land can only be sold once, and the monies may only be used once, so we have set those aside. Much of that money from Wabik has been used for the demolition, asbestos abatement work at Hickory Grove, the north side of Lasser, as well as the old board office. And so, Pine so, Lake. And Pine Lake, thank you. And then for the Hickory Grove property, uh, while it seems like it's been a while, uh, we have not yet finalized and closed on that property. When we do, about half of the monies will be coming in, and that is expected yet this spring. And then it'll be until the next phase of that development happens when we receive the other half of the monies. So that hopefully answers some of the questions that I know have been coming in, and we will add that to the website shortly. Any questions that you've heard? that we might address? Comments? Yeah, I got a couple, go ahead, Brian. Yep. I would just make one comment. Um, as you can see from the description of items that uh, Tina went through and Brian you know, had put together, these are things that just have to be done on a regular basis. I mean, you know, we all have houses that you know, the, the driveway starts deteriorating and getting little cracks and potholes, or the roof starts to leak, or our furnaces are old. So these are things that have to get done. Without sinking fund dollars, we have to use our general fund dollars. And the general fund dollars, as uh, we all know on the board, have been constrained and possibly even shrinking over the years. So without the uh, sinking fund approved by the, the taxpayers, we would have to use our general fund dollars to pay for these things. These are not options. We will have to do this, which means it takes money away from the classroom. So this is really something that uh, we really would greatly appreciate if the community could approve because it really does help the, uh, the education. Even though these are brick and mortar type of expenses, they really have a, a very definite indirect effect on the classroom. Other comments? Um, I just wanted to add a couple of things that absentee ballots are available now. I do know people who have already voted. Um, so please take advantage of the opportunity and get out and vote for it and, and to hope you will support our sinking fund renewal, uh, our replacement. Um, and I was going to say the same thing, one of the same things that uh, Howard was just saying. And I also want to, again, thank Representative McCready who really was instrumental in helping to get the expanded definition and uses uh, for these dollars, um, which really will help us. And because um, he really was a, a, a key force to really make that change um, become reality. And that was something that we had hoped for for many years previously. Um, 
And I just would say, in re reinforcement of what Howard just mentioned, is that um, I've been on this board quite a long time and it was a, for many years. We always did need to use two and a half, three million dollars every year to, uh, to absorb the cost from our general operating budget to do this kind of uh, projects. And um, it really does make a difference on what we can provide to our students in order to, uh, to be able to have these funds available to us. So it is really a vitally important part ongoing for the school district to be able to have these dollars available to help offset the, uh, these expenses so we can keep them more focused on our kids. I think, I think that I would just like to have you mention just again about that it's a replacement. Would you just reiterate what that means? Yes. Um, so basically we have one more year under our current sinking fund millage that we can levy. And we levy twice a year in the summer and winter, half and half. And so in lieu of that one more year this year, we are asking for this replacement so immediately what we levy in July and December falls under the new law. And it's the same rate as last year. The same rate as last year. It starts out that way. We're actually, we, our rate has been decreasing because of Headley rules, but I don't think, uh, we try to explain that on the website. Um, but we did get a question, and this is probably worth noting, we have been fortunate to see property values start to rise. And with those rising property values um, that in the form of SEV, or state equalized value, they certainly have been growing. But millage rates are actually multiplied by the taxable value, and taxable value growth is capped. So that therefore caps us. And to the extent our total property values in all of the district rise more than inflation over last year, the rate actually gets rolled back to prevent us from collecting more than an inflationary increase. That was about that. Let me just add also with what uh, Representative McCready allowed us uh, with the change in the law is obviously technology, which is always changing and always evolving as society is, but it's security. And where we had Sandy Hook and things like that in the you know not so distant past, but obviously over the last few months we had Parkland, just in February. So the whole country is having discussions related to school security. You know, how appropriate that we at this time are able to renew, incorporate security into this, and give Brian the flexibility with Corey uh, Donberger to really look at our security needs in our buildings and. Uh, spend our dial dollars wisely to protect our children. And with that, Brian actually brought up an excellent point. We talked about replacing this last year. The request also adds another five. So we are asking for six years, just to make that clear. Replacing this year's levy and then adding another five, all under the new expanded legislation. Very good. Any other remarks from the board? So when is that election date? That would be May 8. Okay, thank you. Very good, thank you very much, thank appreciate you. it. <coughs> All right, next on our agenda is general discussion and we have uh, a, a meeting of the Finance Facilities and Legal Affairs Committee. Uh, Mr. Bank, do you, do you have some comments to make about that? A few things to add, a lot of it's been covered in reports uh, from cabinet uh, that were disseminated and other comments are made tonight, so I'll do my best not to be redundant. Uh, we've covered six items. The first one we covered was uh, child care, uh, before school care, after school care, and there hadn't been any change in the rates since 2008. We're the least expensive uh, district in the county, and they presented to us uh, the need to increase the rates very slightly. We're talking about uh, a dollar a day increase and we would still be a uh, lower cost than all of our neighbors, but the increase is needed due to uh, new regulations requiring on-site supervisors, higher costs with insurance, higher costs of supplies, and we received a very thorough presentation, and it looks like very sound reasoning and, uh, and needed at this time. The second thing that we covered was uh, custodial services. Uh, Brian's working on addressing some issues. 
uh, relative to uh, the contract, and he'll be bringing uh, much more detail to the board uh, in the coming weeks with that. Uh, this third and fourth items had to do with refuse collection and renewal, renewal of the GFL contract and the purchase of two Ford Transit vans. And since we already voted on that in the consent agenda, I will not uh, belabor the points any further. Uh, fifth thing that we talked about was the master property plan update, and uh, Rob included a lot of that in his update this week. The only thing that I would add, and Tina had mentioned it, that the Hickory Grove uh, site's ready for uh, the first closing, and half of the money is expected sometime uh, this spring. And actually, I think Tina just said that, and I was redundant despite my intentions not to be. And last, uh, was added to the agenda discussion regarding uh, budget balancing actions for next year and good news and bad news. Good news being that uh, they've identified approximately a million dollars in savings for next year and the bad news being despite that, uh, we're still projecting at a loss uh, for next year. And that covers everything that we discussed. Questions from anybody who was there? Thank you, Mr. Bank. Um, only other, other thing I have for general discussion is to say thank you to the Nature Center because, yes, with spring, one of the early gifts of spring is maple syrup. And uh, I know they had their syrup uh, uh, collecting time at the Nature Center, and this is one of my favorite. One of the things I figure is this is how I get paid as a school board <laughs> member. <laughs> this is liquid gold. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing, and I love having it. Thank you so much to all of those who did the hard work because it takes a lot of syrup to make a little, a lot of, of sap to make a very little bit of syrup. Before we move on, I'm going to uh, mention the, um, the meeting that we have next week related to um, the School Finance Research Club. I, I did announce that earlier. Oh, I didn't hear it. I'm sorry. So just to, re to reiterate that, um, Bob Moore yeah. will be coming next Wednesday morning um, at 9.30 here in this room um, to d discuss the uh, School Finance Research Collaborative re um, uh, Report. Um, and I just want to mention that he has been celebrated this year as the Michigan uh, School Business Official of the Year for the State of wow. Michigan, mm -hmm. and uh, which is extremely oh, well deserved. Yeah. He's done a uh, hero job in uh, the work he has done to help to bring the, to light the uh, information on school finance that uh, the whole state will benefit from. So I encourage all of you to come. He is the guru. There is, there, he is the best. Uh, and I know that they, this has been announced that it is open also to Birmingham as well as Bloomingham fam, uh, Bloomfield families to come and be part of this presentation next Wednesday morning, 9.30 here in this room. Right, right. All right, with that, we are uh, into public comment time. At this point, I do not have any cards. All right, well, hearing none, one, two, three, gone. Okay, uh, then we move on into board business. And we only have one item on our agenda this evening, uh, which is the approval of policy number 5400, uh, firearms and other weapons. And uh, Ke while Kelly is coming up, we have uh, had a first reading of this uh, policy at our last board meeting and uh, we had further discussion um, during our study session earlier this evening and um, I guess first I'd like to have a get a motion on the table for a discussion. Are you going to do that? Oh, I can let me get the, uh, the right page. page I'm sorry. All right, um, our request that we approve policy 5400, uh, firearms and other weapons. I have support. Um, discussion, Kelly, please, your comments. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to share, while this policy may not meet all of our needs at this time, I'm requesting its adoption tonight to set the expectation that as a district, we are a dangerous weapons-free zone. 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, I guess first I'd like to have somebody read the policy. Policy right. 5400, firearms and other weapons. To the full extent permitted by law, the district prohibits firearms and other weapons on district premises and at district related functions. District employees and students who violate this policy are subject to discipline, including permanent expulsion or discharge. Others who violate this policy are subject to being banned from district premises and district related functions. This policy should not be interpreted to prohibit the possession of firearms and other weapons on district grounds by members of law enforcement or others authorized by the district to protect student and staff safety. The district reserves the right to report to police authorities any person who violates this policy. So earlier this evening, um, Bob Lusk from Lusk Albertson did come and speak with us. And as we had discussion at our last board meeting, um, we wanted to, this is a fairly straightforward, simple um, policy, but there are a lot of other pieces that can be, um, we, we think can maybe make it, uh, improve it. And so we had a, a very rich conversation earlier this evening with um, great input from the board. Um, so our intent is to try to, I hope my colleagues will want, want to approve the policy that is before us this evening with the uh, intention that we would continue to uh, improve it and bring it back for, re for, uh, a pr uh, for revision um, in the near future. Other comments, Mr. Bank? I think as we discussed in the two hour meeting earlier tonight, this is an excellent first step and it sends a very strong message uh, to the community as to what our expectations are uh, for safety here in Bloomfield Hills, but it's a first step. And this, this language, we need to put something in place as soon as possible, but as we discussed earlier, it can definitely be improved upon, and we're gonna to continue to work on that and uh, hone this policy and revise it in the weeks to come as needed to make it as strong as possible. And I just want to mention that in our first reading, we had um, several members uh, of the public at our public comment, and uh, uh, there was a lot of support for our strategy of um, implementing a policy as soon as possible, um, but also being able to really hone it um, in the future and come back and revise it, as Mark mentioned. Any other comments from the board? Then I call for the question. All in favor of policy number 5400, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I really feel it's important that um, we share with our staff, our students, and our community uh, this is an important statement that we need to be shared. All right, well then I believe that concludes all of our business before us this evening. Um, everybody, hopefully spring is here to stay and uh, a lot of exciting things on our schedule in the weeks ahead. Uh, look forward to seeing you all soon. Uh, motion to adjourn. Mr. Patrick, thank you. Mm -hmm.